This is really a, a adjusted math ed talk. And since we were told by people, have I got it? Yes. We had to have audience participation, and my audience participation is first. So what you're going to do is do what my students did when I interviewed them, except much briefer, and then you'll get an appreciation for what the students did. So I got students together uh, to, in an interview setting, they were at the end of a transition to proof course, and I took the same protocol and the same thing I had done about 10 years earlier in a beginning of a transition to proof course to see what they would do. And so I had them look at four student constructed proofs, so proof attempts. And this theorem, a very easy theorem for any positive integer n, if n squared is a multiple of three, then n is a multiple of three. And I had them think aloud and say to me whether it was a proof or not. They had no training in this, but they had been in an IBL course, and proving stuff for themselves. And is it a proof or isn't it? And what's wrong with it if it isn't? So here's your job. And you can shout it out or from the microphone. So we're going to look at each proof for about two minutes. You've, if you, I didn't realize we'd have such a big screen, so I think you can read it there. That's why the handouts also have them. The one-page handout is the entire protocol, uh, what I did. And the other three-pager is exactly what I'm putting up on the screen today. So this is proof attempt A. And what I want you to do, and John's supposed to be keeping track of the time, is think about it and say what you think. Well, first, is it a proof? Sorry, is it a proof or, and if not, what's wrong with it? I might say that I collected these proofs from a much earlier, got to be 15 or 20 years ago, transition to proof class. So these are proofs from real students. And uh, maybe I'd say, I hope I got to be a better teacher now so there'd be better results. But I picked these out specifically from other students. So if you'd like to say something, please do, because you're supposed to get a feeling for what the student, the task the students had to do. A little reaction, please. <laughs> Wouldn't somebody like Milos, if he's here, get up? Because I know he's seen this stuff before. Or Sarah, she's seen this stuff before. <laughs> Any feedback, please? My name is uh, JC Price. And uh, my first thought is it says uh, uh, n squared is an odd positive integer div divisible by uh, 3. So I don't see how n squared is divisible by 3 there. It says 3n plus 1 squared. That's my first thought. Okay. So you don't like that line when I, where the equals start, where it says n squared equals 3n plus 1 squared. Okay. Any other reactions? Hi. Uh, Dan Swenson, Black Hills State University. Um, the word odd is um, not in the statement of the theorem, so it's unclear where that came from. I'll make another comment. My name again is J.C. Price. Uh, I, I also don't like how they used n for n squared and then n or n in 3n plus 1. Oh, so a double two, usage of n. Yeah, two uses of n, two different uses of n. Okay. John, have we done our two or three minutes? Oh, here's somebody else with a comment. I have a different problem. Um, it look, oh, sorry. My name is Amanda Matson at Clark University. They seem to not know what their goal is. They keep trying to come back to n squared as a multiple of 3 rather than n as a multiple of 3, except at the very end when they conclude that obviously this means that n is a multiple of 3. So at least for uh, the first part, they go from n squared is divisible or a multiple of 3 to the same thing. So they're going a long way around to get back where they started, is what I think you're saying. Is it about time for the next one? All right. 
Next one. This is the next proof from a student. And uh, read it and make some comments. The first comment is, I guess you decided that proof A was wrong because you find so much wrong with it. Uh, just like my interviewees, they, I had to push them to say, is it a proof or isn't it a proof when you get finished reading. Um, okay. So we want to know if this one's a proof or not. And then if it isn't, what's wrong with it? These are a little long. The next two will be shorter, which means it's easier to read. So anybody have a comment on this one? Before I tell you at the end what the students said. I want at least one comment. Somebody get up and say something. Nobody wants to say anything? You're professors. You're used to getting up and saying things. My name's Molly Stubblefield from University of Oklahoma. And I think this is a much better proof, but I think they could have explained a little bit more why 3K plus 1 and 3K plus 2 are not multiples of 3. Not divisible, What I does guess. better proof mean? Uh, it's correct, I mean, to in me my it's opinion. either a proof or it is it. <laughs> well, I think this one is, and I think the first one is not. All right. All right, so I think I, I don't want to use too much time because you want to hear what the student said. So here's C, and this one at least is short. You have no trouble getting through reading it. So again, is it a proof or isn't it? If it's not a proof, what's wrong with it? Oh, I have to give some background here because this is the one on which most professors disagree. You have to remember that these are transition to proof course students, the students who wrote the proofs. And they haven't had abstract algebra or number theory or anything like that because proof is always within a context. And so you have to know the context. Okay? Well, nobody wants to make at least one comment? Come on. You'll appreciate I'll make a the student's comments better if you make one. Uh, if there was, this was given in my transitions course, I'd say, well, well why does 3 divide in? I don't see it. Right? Why? Why? Okay. That's a nice comment. Anybody else want to make a comment or go on to D? D. This is short, too. So you won't have any time, trouble getting through it. So is it a proof? Isn't it a proof? If it's not a proof, what's wrong with it? I want at least one comment before we go on, just one. If you want a dozen, that's good too. Kevin Watson from Brigham Young University. Um, they like assume what they're trying to conclude because they say n is equal to 3m, which is essentially what you're trying to conclude at the end of this proof. Okay, they're assuming what they want to prove. All right, anybody else have a comment? Milo Savage just got called out by you. And um, <laughs> also, um, at the end, um, the student is confused about N and M and what they want to conclude at the end, so. Okay. Uh, you have to understand, me and Loge is our PhD student, so he's used to my ribbing him. I wouldn't do it to any of you. That's my privilege as an advisor. <laughs> I mean, he was our PhD student. He's a full-fledged assistant professor now. Okay, so the math ed research question was, would take in an IBL transition to proof course that we taught from our own notes and having them get to the board, et cetera, and go through their proofs, and et cetera, make them better at what we call validation, reading and checking other people's proofs, and why this is a question I got when I did it at the room conference from the reviewers. Why would anybody think that? Well, I think mathematicians think that because they teach courses, whether IBL or not. They assign proofs in abstract algebra, et cetera, real analysis, and they want people to hand in correct things. So whether you're a student or a professor, you want to hand in something correct. So why wouldn't you reread it? Okay. Now, you know this stuff, so I'll go through it quickly. Uh, okay, students were interviewed at the end of the course. It was IBL. They had notes, definitions, requests for examples, statements of theorems to prove. A very much more Moore method. They proved the theorems outside of class. They presented their proofs in class. 
but we gave them, well, John did, extensive critiques. So the topics were sets, functions, continuity, beginning, abstract, algebra, which we do semi-groups, so they certainly can't look anything up. And our aim is to get them ready for things like real analysis and abstract algebra, and we want them to see and experience as many different kinds of proofs as possible. In addition to the homework, and we discovered with sophomores, or at least sophomore level courses, unlike graduate students, you do have to assign homework. You say, do the next three theorems for the next class. <laughs> Otherwise, you don't get it. And I collected them in the back, and I got students to present ones. They knew that if they were asked to present one, it was because it was interesting for discussion, not that it was right, necessarily. And so in addition to this homework, the daily theorems, they had a midterm and a final. Okay, so that's the course. There were 17, only 16 wanted to participate for extra credit. 81% uh, were math majors, secondary ed math majors, or in math-related fields like electrical engineering or computer science. This is an odd course, I think, because our school does not require, not that you need it for thinking, calculus. So we get some engineering tech students, which are not included in that. So this is a little study. So I got them to sign up for extra credit. They didn't the last two weeks of class. They signed up for a one hour time slot. They were told they didn't have to study. And the protocol is the one you have on your one page handout which is from our 2003 JRME paper, it's the study we did. Okay, so they were asked to think aloud and decide whether these proofs were indeed proofs. And they were encouraged to ask clarification questions and they did. And I said, of course you can't ask if it's a proof, but I mean, I'll tell you whether I wanna give you more information or not, be sure to ask me. They had a fact sheet, which you have on your one pager. And in addition, uh, they were told then what the job was. They were to look at four student constructed proofs of a single number theory theorem. Oh, and we didn't do any number theory in our course. I told you the topics. This is the four phases. They're exactly the same. So I hadn't tried to prove it. Then they went through the pages one by one. So they, I didn't do any live scribe pens, I just had a tape recorder and I took my own notes and they wrote on the paper. Anything they wanted to write on the paper, just so they had some paper. And then after they'd looked at each one, they looked at all four of them together, all four proofs, and then I asked them stuff about how they think they read proofs. Okay, so I think I told you most of this. Uh, one student took as much as 25 minutes, so they took their tasks seriously. They did ask questions such as, what's that bar? Three divides n squared, they didn't know. Remember, they didn't have any number theory. And I told you they were audio recorded. So we looked at the number of correct judgments they made individually and as a group, their validation, valid, and comments, etc. cetera. Uh, the amount of time they took, whether they underlined or circled things, whether they substituted for N, whether they looked at the fact sheet, everything we could think of. And this is just the time they took. And so that's a, you can see, the maximum was a lot, but sometimes they went pretty fast through them. So it depended. Okay, so here's some general stuff before I get to the individual comments. They underlined or circled parts of the proof. They went across with their fingers or their pencil. I mean, to me, this is indications of really trying to do a good job. And they checked the algebra. Somebody said about this 3n, well, a little different, but they, whether 3n plus 1 squared was foiled correctly. Uh, they substitute numbers for n to see if it made sense. They read all or parts of the purported proofs again, and they consulted the fact sheet. Okay, let's see what we got here. Oh, CY was very interesting. He really objected to proof B. 
the one you said was a proof and the one actually a 2003 paper. We said it was a proof because, well, he'd had a logic course before. He was interesting because he came back for another degree. He'd been in philosophy or something before. Anyhow, he said it was not a proof by contradiction. He didn't really like it. It was a proof by contrapositive. So he, and we teach by something we call a proof framework, which you can ask me about now. They have to write the beginning, the end, unpack the end, blah, 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 figure out where they're going. And I had reminded them that the students whose proofs they were checking hadn't been taught that way. But because they'd been taught that way, they looked for it. Okay. Uh, they said a lot of things. Uh, confusing, convoluted, a mess. The notation was wacky. Uh, proof D, they introduced N and then they went to M and they didn't go back to N. And this is a good one actually, not knowing what the students who had constructed the proofs knew or were allowed to assume. Thank you. So I've got to go a little faster. Okay. Uh, overall, I got local and overall comments. So A, B, C, D. Okay. So they didn't like the string of equals. Somebody here noted that. Uh, it's got a problem. If you substitute 1 in for 3n plus 1, it's not odd, it's even. And this thing using n two different ways, n square equal 9n square. So notice that. Overall comments, I can't see where they're going. It doesn't seem right. They're not going where they need to go. It's not a proof. Um, and these interesting things. Never use these words ourselves in class. It's not a proper proof, whatever that means. Or it's a partial proof. I don't know what that means either. Uh, okay, D. This is kind of a framework statement. I'm not seeing the closing statement. We want our students to. Now I know mathematicians don't always end by repeating the conclusion, but these are beginners. And this is not a proof because we don't introduce the letter N, but we use N. Uh, overall comments on B. This one looks a lot better. It's making a lot more sense to me than A. It's not written well. We do a work on style. Okay. I feel it's a proof because they're showing that the two integers in between, the 3n plus 1 and 3n plus 2, are not multiples of 3. I think Molly made that comment, but I can't remember. Somebody here made that comment. And so that's a very structural comment. That's what I mean. Okay. C. That bit about any x, x any integer worries me. Now, you all know they have trouble with quantifiers. And so this student picked up on that. You're supposed to fix your x. If, I've forgotten what x is in C right now, but you have it in front of you. So he picked on this word any. He didn't like it. Okay. And overall, I can't get my head around it. I don't buy it. I need more information. It's closer to a proof than the others, whatever that means. And I don't think this is a proof. It doesn't have enough information. It doesn't go into detail. I don't know why it works. D, a local comment. Why would you use M? They want to know. It's confusing. Okay, picking on that. Uh, and the other one was he's putting in more information than needs to be there. Uh, that doesn't help it. And it's not a strong proof. Again, that's not a word we had done. I'm supposed to quit, John says. Okay. Can I go a little further? Yeah, yeah. Okay, two minutes. Okay. So they didn't focus. See, their job was to just decide whether it was a proof, but they wanted to tell me all kinds of things, which was nice. I mean, they said what they thought. They were good at thinking aloud. So a lot of had the comments were on style or personal profession personal preference or being confused or whatever. And this is what they say, Part D. They read it several times. They work through the proofs with an example. They say it's a proof if it makes sense or they understand it. Uh, if it has a single mistake in it, it's not a proof or they don't set out, you know, go where they're supposed to. And they claim to check every step. So that's what they think they do. And the answer to the research question, okay. 
So I'm comparing them to the students 10 years earlier, not the same batch of students at the beginning of a transition to proof. And they actually did worse. So that they're and than the ones at the beginning, if you percentage of correct judgments. And they were, if we looked at where they were, further along academically, by which I mean 56% of these were in their fourth year of university, whereas 37.5 were in their fourth year for the other study. Uh, caveat, they don't like transition to proof courses. In general, they take them after the students. The courses are supposed to help. They take abstract algebra and stuff first, and then they take the transition to proof course. I mean, a certain number of them. Okay. Uh, so we had conjectured because we taught what we thought was this great IBL course and they'd been up to the board that they would be better at checking proofs than the earlier students, but they weren't. So what's our conclusion? If you want students to read and check or future teachers, this is really important, messy proofs, you need to teach it explicitly. Now I have to be careful here on an IBL audience. I don't mean lecture on it. You can think of exercises, hand them some student proofs and let them work on them in groups and discuss them afterwards or something. But just apparently critiquing their own proofs the way we did didn't work. So it seems kind of counterintuitive because most of the mathematicians out there have not had IBL courses, some of them have, but they get their feedback on proofs by usually professors coming and on the pieces of paper and then they get their feedback when they're doing their dissertations. And they just hand, no, they have to hand in correct proofs. But nobody says how you read and check every line and what you're looking for and you're looking for implicit warrants, reasons. Okay, I'm done. I just have some references. Frank Sturm, Auburn University. Um, I like kind of the moral because just growing up with the uh, IBL education, that is one thing that I do notice. You get very good at trying to prove things yourself and sometimes you forget to try to really pay close, close attention to what other people are doing if you can do it yourself. So it seems really important. Um, but also I wanted to ask, you mentioned teaching this framework for whenever they were writing proofs. And I'm just kind of curious to what, what degree, because I'm always reluctant to try to incorporate that much structure or anything like that into a, a course. So to what degree did, did you emphasize they use this? And a lot, and we're going to do more at this level. We teach a similar course to graduate students who need, believe it or not, some come to graduate school in mathematics who are still not confident in proving. And they need our course, they decide they need it. And they aren't forced to take it. Okay, so the framework, we think we're gonna do more direct instruction on that. We like them to write, the, we've gotten to calling a first level framework and a second level framework. We like them to write the hypotheses. Okay, first we like if to then is supposed to have the hypotheses, then to the period is supposed to have the conclusion. It's easier for the students to figure out what's going on rather than these whenevers and these fancy kinds of statements that are the way we prefer to present our statements of theorems. So they know they're supposed to put the hypotheses and the conclusion. They're supposed to look at the end. So many don't look at the end. They start at the beginning and go all over the place. We make them, make them, suggest, they unpack it on a side piece, like what is the definition of continuity? What does it mean in this particular context? Like if you've got the sum of two continuous functions, f is defined as continuous, you've got to now change it to f plus g is continuous. And so then there's a, what we call a second level framework. And it gets to the point where what we call exposes the problem what the mathematicians are really interested in. The mathematicians, sorry, not you all, but some of them, seem to think the other stuff is automatic. The students know what they're supposed to do, but they don't. And so in a sophomore level course like this, we teach it. In your mind, how much do you believe that students uh, validate their own proofs 
or I mean in a calculus setting or in a pre-calculus setting, how much do they validate their own work? I think, well, we haven't done a study, Neil, as you know that, but I think they do it very little. I think that they think that it's the teacher's job to tell them where they went wrong. That's what I think. And so they're not checking it. Maybe the A students are because they know, you know, got pre-meds in there, they got to get their A's. <laughs> and they may feel, I have to go over it because like in a calculus problem, I may make just a tiny little error, like a plus is into a minus, we've had that. And so, yeah, I don't think they do it. And so that's why I think you have to teach it explicitly. Explicitly meaning do something, not necessarily talk about it. I'm sorry. Just one minor question. What about persistence? Would that be um, a cause and effect? I mean, if a student had mathematical persistence, would they? Then... Where are they going to get it, man? <laughs> I mean, That's... I mean, I, if they've had in maybe one of these other early IBL courses, mm -hmm. but I don't know where, I mean, it may be a person. I think persistence and all those things mathematical habits of mind are confused with personality. I think, and we're going to work on teaching them. Again, we don't know how. And it's clear from the students, we listen to the students, like those two who did their impressions of their own proof course and had then gone on, that they learned somehow through the course to persist, the structure of the course. But there ought to be another way, too, to get at it. Let's thank our speakers.